Hello everybody and welcome back to the United Stand on today's afternoon show. We have a very special interview. Joining us is Paul Hurst from The Times. Paul, thank you very much. I'm excited to discuss all things new, maybe a new Old yeah. Trafford, Sir Jim and everything like that. But thank you for coming on the channel. Oh, my pleasure. Great stuff. I mean, let's get straight into it. And everyone, if you've got your questions or anything you want to ask, ask away in the chat as well. Put your super chats in and we'll get them questions to Paul. But first things first, let's get into it. Everyone's talking about New Trafford, mm -hmm. Old Trafford. I mean, Sir Jim spoke out yesterday in his interview. He seemed very keen on straight away getting into either a redevelopment of Old Trafford or a, a complete new stadium. Do you think with with them plans, do you think he's keen to get going on that straight away? Do you think that that's something that will happen quite quickly? Yeah, well, one of the quotes that stood out for me in, the, in those interviews yesterday was he said, we don't want to hang around. Mm. And that to me says, right, we want to start planning it, start working on it this summer, you know, or summer, even before the end of the season. They want to they want to make a decision on whether it's a refurb or whether it's a, a new stadium, uh, a new Trafford, as you said. Um, so they, they want to get cracking on it. They... They see they've obviously been round Old Trafford, been round Carrington last few weeks to have a look at what it's like. You know, so Jim's been there as a fan before. And another thing that stood out for me in those interviews yesterday was he said that Old Trafford is not befitting of a, a top class club at the moment. Maybe it was 20 years ago, but now you look at it and it is it's crumbling in yeah. parts, isn't it? You we know, both go along. We holes know. in the roof, <laughs> yeah. I know it might, where I sit in the press box, there's a hole in the roof there. So it lit every so often. It just like the the sort of water droplets strategically land straight in the middle of my laptop, which is not <laughs> ideal when you're um, when you're trying to write. But you know the fans have had that as well. You know they've had water on their heads, and it's just it's not for all the history that it's got and all the you know the grandeur that it's got. It, it is a very tired looking stadium, isn't it? So you can see why they'd want to want to build a new one. I think that is what they'd ideally they'd like to do. They want to build a new one rather than refurb it. Yeah, I was going to ask about that actually because there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of like discussion online about whether they'd want to redevelop Old Trafford or make a new stadium. I was actually looking at your article that you did, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, on potentially, you know, what, what could mm. happen. I mean, looking at it, what do you think the benefits are to redeveloping and then obviously the benefits to a new stadium? Right, the, the redevelopment would be, the pros of that would be that you'd obviously stay in the stadium, that it'd be, you wouldn't have to, you, but they obviously build on top of it, they get another you know, 20,000, 15,000 seats on it. It wouldn't, in theory, cause that much disruption. But then the cons of it are the fact that if you are going to expand it, it's going to be on the Sir Bobby Charlton stand, which is a railway uh, right behind it. So that's difficult, it's expensive to to um, to build on top of that and impractical. Uh, and, you know, the, it might have the situation where they have to shut one stand or even more than one stand and then, you know, continue playing. So that would reduce the amount of money that's coming into the club on a match day. Um, the cons, uh, sorry, the pros of the, a new stadium are the fact that, it's, you know, they could build like a, a world-class, you know, Wembley of the North, as, as has been touted, you know, an 80, 90-seater stadium that is the bee's knees, that is not you know, decrepit, it's not looking tired, it's not looking, you know, the paint's not um, like peeling off the walls. And you look at some of the other, some of the other stadiums, like the one that Tottenham have built, it's um, it's just like astounding really, the difference in in that and, and Old Trafford. Even like, I think in that article, I spoke to someone who goes, you know, regularly in, in director's boxes looking at, uh, and she's been up and down the, the country. And she said that that Old Trafford is like a, a service station compared to, you know, it's like going to a service station cafe compared to Spurs. They've got the you know, Michelin-starred food and, you know, you feel like you're at a... You said, oh, I feel like I'm going to a premiere when I go to a Spurs stadium. Because, you know, the director's box there is just, like, all spangly and, and fantastic. And you feel like you're at a proper a proper ground there. So, yeah, that that will be the attraction of a new one, a new stadium, but it's the cost that will be the big um, negative about that. It's two, it'd be £2 billion... Pounds is what Sir Jim Ratcliffe was saying for a new stadium estimate. So he's got to raise some of that money through, um, you know, through private firms, through sponsorship, and he wants uh, public funding as well. It's a, a topic that he raised yesterday. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to get on to the costing of it and how we would subsidise that as a club. And obviously he's even looking at, like you said, public funding. We'll get on to that and kind of what mm. discussions that could cause. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people 
who aren't United yeah. fans wouldn't be wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't no, be yeah. wouldn't be kind of looking forward to that. But in terms of where the new stadium would be, a lot of people are saying mm. they don't want to move the location. We were just ter- talking earlier. I mean, it's most likely. Where would it be? Would you say the new the new stadium? It'd be in the car park behind <clears throat> the Stretford End, wouldn't it? That's where that's where they're looking at. Um, that, there's a huge area behind behind the stadium that is <clears throat> currently used for car parking, and, and there's warehouses as well. Most of it's owned by United, but some of it isn't. So they'd have to buy the the part that it isn't. Um, but there's so much land there for, for them to do it. And I think if you look at that area around it, there's not nothing really there, is it? It's kind of just it's like a dual carriageway. There's hotel football further up the road. But, you know, as you go onto the wharf, there's not really anything there. And that's what the traffic council are looking to rebuild, to revamp that area as well. They announced a, a master plan for, for regenerating that area um, last week. And that'll be heard at a council meeting on Monday. Um, so we'll know then whether that gets the go-ahead. That's been funded by Trafford Council. The, the whole idea is to regenerate that, that area of, of, of um, you know, like uh, South Manchester. That's what Sir Jim Ratcliffe wants. That's his idea. And if he, he spoke yesterday about Man City, you know, the way that they've regenerated East Manchester and West Ham as well, with what they've done with the Olympic Stadium around there. So that's his his grand vision to have like a, a, a huge stadium and have like a sort of a fan friendly area around it because you know now there's not really much around Old Trafford is there you know if, if you were a family if you're bringing your kid here what, what do you do before kickoff you I know? think there's a Nando's on the retail <laughs> yeah. park and that's about it. The Lumacari's chippy. Yeah, there's, 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 there's Nando's, there's a Costa Coffee and there's yeah. Lumacari chipping obviously there's Bishop's, Bishop's Blaze, Blaze they're yeah. all absolutely packed <laughs> yeah, aren't yeah, they? Yeah. What else do you do? And like, I know some people think that city's ground is a bit you know the area around it is a bit plastic and you know it does it is a bit some you know i agree with that to a certain extent but if you're if you're getting off the tram at city you walk straight up to you know, up the stands you get up the stairs and there's immediately an area where you know there's the stalls for you know to buy food and drink and there's a band playing there's a light live show and you see that is much more family friendly than anything around here and obviously with man city no disrespect to them, but they don't have the fan base that Manchester United have had. So obviously ours would have kind of more of a... I feel like it would have more atmosphere anyway around it. And mm. would you say that they're looking to make it sort of like maybe a bit campus-based then? Yeah, I think that's the plan. You know, make it all... You know, come here come here three hours before kickoff, basically, and, and kind of, you know, go to... You know, spend time in one of the, you know, the pubs or restaurants around that they're hoping to build... Um, you know that that's what they want to get people to make an actual like a full day kind of experience rather than just get it five minutes before kick off and then leave straight afterwards. Do you think they'd keep the pitch of Old Trafford there if they were to build a new stadium next to it? Uh, I'm not sure to be honest. I don't see why they won't be able to you know to to move it to transport it just uh, just down the way. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean they they re- generally tend to relay it every summer anyway, so mm-hmm. so that's yeah that shouldn't be an issue. It'd be interesting to see kind of what happens with that. So, as we were saying, the way he was speaking in his interview, it did look like he was keen on the complete new stadium, which is interesting. I mean, get your opinions in the chat. Would you want a new stadium? Would you want a refurb? I'm in the camp where, to be honest, I'd be looking towards, I'd think I'd prefer to have a new stadium, but I know everyone's different. But in terms of how we're going to fund this, obviously, I think Sir Jim is already pledged to put in 245 million of his own money to yeah. upgrade the club infrastructure but mm-hmm. that's not going to stretch that far no let's no be honest. yeah yeah sounds a lot doesn't it but yeah. it's nothing really it's, it's, it's literally nothing especially when we're talking about <clears> two billion figures yeah. here yeah so where does this get funded does debt get put onto the club naming rights is something that's mm-hmm. come up and then obviously he's looking for public backing but i've seen already a few people not too happy with that yeah there's already been a backlash um, regarding the public funding and i can I can understand that you know particularly when People would say argue that United are the you know the richest club in the world or in, in England and you know so why should we give them money and so Jim's obviously a multi billionaire as well um, but his argument is that it's not Old Trafford or the, the new stadium would not just be for Man United fans it'd be for you know for the area and so that that's his argument that they should you know that public money from uh, would would go towards a uh, you know, towards houses around like the wharf side, etc. Jobs. Jobs, yeah, exactly. So it all kind of pours back into the, you know, into the economy. Um, and you look at if, if you're thinking Wembley of the North, like think about how how much Wembley is used by the public, like across the country in, yeah. in London, and having yeah. that sort of facility in Manchester would drive 
not only just match days, but everything really. Yeah, I, I remember when I used to work down in London about 10, 12 years ago, and I did the, um, remember going to Wembley for finals, and it was like, there's nothing there next to the stadium. There's like Wembley, Wembley Arena, and then that was it. But, you know, there was a McDonald's just up the other way, or, or Wembley Way. But now there's a big like shopping centre there, isn't there, where you've mm. got loads of restaurants, etc. You know, the Box Park on, on Wembley Way and, and other um, pubs um, uh, on in little kind of stalls, etc. So that has, has totally revamped the area. Um, so that would be a similar idea here. I think in terms of naming rights, they've always said that nothing's off the table. Um, but you, what they wouldn't do is they wouldn't rename it the, I don't know, for example, the you know Spotify yeah, Stadium Spotify or something Stadium. like that. It'd have to be do you know done quite subtly, like like you know Old Trafford being brought to you by Spotify or whichever. Old Trafford but, brought to you by Amazon, something like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so it wouldn't be so you, you, they'd always have Old Trafford in the name, so that that part of it wouldn't. He never, you know, that's that's the sacred kind of part of the name that they'd always want to keep. I'm going to be honest. I think if we're spending two billion on a new stadium, I think it's just like I don't see a world which it stays just yeah. old traffic. It's like I feel like they yeah. have to do naming rights just to kind of get some funding because it's absolutely huge in terms of the money that it can bring in. Yeah. But obviously. I would never want it to lose the Old Trafford in its name, and I don't think any United fan would. So it's walking yeah. that tight line of what can you get away with without the fan base yeah. creating a backlash on, on top of that. Yeah, like when Mike Ashley renamed St James's Park, it was something like Sport Direct Arena, but no one ever called it that, did they? Yeah. You know, so <laughs> it's kind of like you're not going to, you know, you won't say, oh, are you going to the, are you going to Old Trafford brought to you by Amazon this afternoon? Yeah, right? it's still it's just, Old Trafford. It's just it's all it's all about that kind of the prestige for the for the sponsor, isn't it? So. Yeah, I, I I agree with you that there's got to be some kind of input from a sponsor in, in terms of naming rights. I think that would be that would generate a lot of money and that'd be a, a really good start. Yeah, it absolutely would. And in terms <coughs> of kind of looking towards other redevelopment as well, obviously there was a little bit of talk about Carrington maybe yeah. moving locations, mm. also more training grounds being built. There was articles written about potentially scouting some golf courses in, right. in the Man <laughs> Manchester area. Have you heard much about do um, other infrastructure improvements as well across like the training facilities? Well, if if you look again at what he said yesterday to Jim Ratcliffe, he said that he goes to Carrington and he doesn't feel that it's uh, a decrepit, uh, it's not falling to bits, it is, it's still uh, quite a good training ground. And I agree with him on that. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I went to the um, Youth Academy to do a piece with Nick Cox and he, he walked us through the new um, uh, building for the women's team and the... Um, and the academy and the gym, and that costs seven million, just that part alone. So, and it looks it looks quite swish to us. It looks it looks very, um, you know, cutting edge. Like some of the analysis rooms, there's a, a huge telly there with all different kind of like touch screen um, apparatus, etc. And the main building, the first team building, is is pretty good as well. They've they brought the when Ta when Tenag came in, he wanted a new analysis room there, so they spent a lot of money. I think it was. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was you know tens of thousands on a new, um, new analysis room with a huge uh, television there again. Um, so I, th I look at it and I think it's not, you know, it's not as if it's falling to bits. I've, I've been to Tottenham's training ground and that's amazing. Uh, Leicester's training ground looks really good. Uh, Chelsea's Arsenal's is really good as well, but I don't think United are like way below that level and they keep investing in it so I think any reinvestment any money that they put towards that will be secondary to the to the stadium I think that's the main priority and in terms of the stadium I mean you talk about you know the youth team currently who play predominantly at least sports village yeah. the women's team as well yeah. do you think there could be a world with with the new stadium where like all of them are in the same vicinity yeah definitely I, I think I mean let's be honest who likes going to Lee sports village I know it's, it's such a, it's, 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 it's such a track to kind of just like and especially say say if like you know United like men's team have a game say th I don't know twelve thirty and then you've got a, a women's or, or a youth yeah. game at like four thirty or something like that you'd like it'd be you'd be able to go to both if it's yeah. in the same vicinity but if it's at least Sports Village it's a bit of a track you've got traffic yeah. and everything like that miles away it's not a great stadium it's it's cold and you know. I've I've never really warmed to it as you as you can tell. Um, I don't think I've heard anybody. No, really. yeah, who has? Yeah, it's really when it's not yours, when it's not related to Man United, it's, it's hard, isn't it? Really, because mm -hmm. it's 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 not it's not your property. But I think what what came out of the chat yesterday was again Sir Jim saying that 
ideally you'd have like a little mini sta mini stadium here like somewhere on the campus you know like um like barcelona have or used to they've moved to the training ground uh, with their academy recently but um you know, just somewhere you could have like little you know man city again have, have got a really nice little you know 7000 8000 seat stadium where the women team women women's and the uh, the academy play occasionally, uh, go over to uh, occasionally play at Etihad as well. So that that would be again another another way of um, sort of improving the facilities and getting, like you say, getting everyone here early to do you know spend the whole afternoon here. Yeah, exactly. Because if you think you know, a lot of the time the women's and sometimes the youth as well do get to play in Old Trafford, but mm. in them times where they're not available to, like to have them next to each other and have it in a vicinity. I, I've spoke I've spoken to a lot of the United fan base, and that's something that a lot of the United fan base are really keen on. So that'd be yeah. really mm. exciting to see. I mean, I just wanted to gauge your opinion. What would, what's your opinion on redeveloping, or completely a new build? I'd it, I'd go for the new build, but it's. Obviously, the cost is a massive issue, but I just think it would be... What are the difference in cost interest? It's, it, well, it, apparently it's, it'll be, what Jim was saying yesterday, that the refurb would cost £1 billion. Okay. And the, the new stadium would be about £2 billion. Um, so... Double the cost. You double the cost, but obviously, if you move to a new stadium, you can start building the new stadium and continue using Old Trafford. So you're still getting your, your match day revenue. You're still getting your 70,000 um, people, 75,000 people in the stadium. On a match day, while you're building the new stadium, so I think it'd just be it'd be a, a, the proper way to start a new era, wouldn't it? To have a, a new stadium and for it to be the the um, you know the, the best you could get. And another thing that Sir Jim was saying yesterday that you look at all the all the England games. Well, most of the England games are played at Wembley, aren't they? And then you've got you know Wimbledon was the the head the the national stadium or national arena for, for tennis. You've got so much base down south that why not have something up here that where England can play, you know, semi regularly, etc. Where you can have FA Cup semi finals where you don't have to, you know, schlep all the way down to, to Wembley for a for a semi final, which no one likes, do they? Media City as well, so close by. <coughs> exactly, yeah. You know, more and more of yeah. the of the broadcast is coming up here. It's yeah. it is really like the hub of the North Manchester, and it's yeah. it'd been. It, I am in complete agreement. I feel like we need that new stadium that has got the longevity in it that can to carry us into the future. But yeah. in terms of if we if we did do a rebuild, do do we know like when that would get started and how long it would take? Uh, they've not put a, a time scale on it yet, but I like I said at the start, of the show he he don't want to hang around. So Jim, he wants everything starting pretty quickly. He's, he's an ambitious guy, and he wants to start, you know, making an impact. Um, he's con got control of football operations now. He wants to make make his um, stamp on proceedings. He's he said oh, I've watched this team for the last, you know, since Sir Alex Ferguson left. Just he said it's been, I think he said it's been pretty miserable. Mm -hmm. And he just wants to start bringing a bit more of a feel good factor to the to the club. So and that that would be a significant way of. Um, you know, starting that process to, to say, right, we're building this magnificent new stadium just uh, just down the road. Yeah, and he's, he started off on, on the right foot, I think, with a lot of United fans. Would you say, like, a, a complete new stadium of that sort of magnitude would take years to build, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think you'd, you'd be probably looking at least two years, aren't you? Um, and But like I said, the, the advantage is that you don't have to find a new home, you don't have to play at, at Lee Sports Village, you don't have to... You know, I mean, someone mentioned like the, the idea of playing the Etihad, but they they that never do ne that. You know, they, you know, we spoke to one of the club last year, and they said, yeah, they'd never never do that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm not sure whether City will let them either, to be honest. So yeah, that that would be the ad. Even if even if it lasted two or three years, as long as you've still got the current Old Trafford to play in, people can go to the match day and they can yeah. see the progress as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Just walk past it on your way to the. That's what the Spurs fans. I remember when. The new Spurs stadium was being built. You know, they walked past White Hart Lane, and it'd be in in you know the building would be in progress. And then, you know, that that sort of that does excite you for the future, doesn't it? Exactly. I mean, it'll be interesting to see where the funding comes and debt would go on to the club in a way. I think so. Yes, yeah. I'm not a massive financial expert, to be honest, but I think that I remember reading around it that that you know that that would be paid off. You know, you get more money through. If you've got a ninety thousand seat stadium, it's twenty, you know, it's fifteen thousand more, more seats, and you just you know, concerts, also, NFL, yeah, like, exactly. And you also everything. get better like hospitality, and I know that this is not like, I don't know every, football is about the fans, you know, the you know, the proper fans and uh, who go like week in week out and play your uh, 
he bogs down the prices, but he, clubs make a heck of a lot of money on uh, hospitality these days. You look at Liverpool's, when Liverpool extended their stand, they brought a new, a new kind of like whole area for hospitality and that, that made him a lot of money. You look at Arsenal, like the whole middle kind of tier is, is, um, is hospitality boxes. And that, you know, they, they make you a lot of money. And you look at, I've, I've been one of the, like, the, the suites here and it's just like... You would, honestly, when I've been in, I've like kindly had the opportunity to. Yeah. I've always thought I would never pay what these <laughs> no, people no, pay yeah. for this. It's like going to, oh, I don't want to say it's like Toby Carvery, but it's just like, you know, it's, it's a bit like, <laughs> nothing wrong with Toby Carvery either. Like, <laughs> uh, but you wouldn't... Um, no, they'll, they'll understand. You pay, you pay a tenner for Toby Carvery. You don't, you don't yeah. pay like, you know... You pay a hundred quid. The difference of going to, from <laughs> yeah. Toby Carver to like Gaucho Grill in town. Yeah, know? exactly. People yeah. that know Manchester, they know what I'm talking about. But yeah, it's just like you would expect a lot more, for, a lot more bang for your buck. And I, I like you, I've, I've been, I you know, did feel quite lucky when I went in to one of the suites um, through a, a contact once, and, I'd, and it, you know it was a really good afternoon, and the seats were really good as well. But I just think, you know, if you are felt, if you're supposed to be like a VIP, and you're the top bracket. You, you, want a, you want a really good uh, food and really good experience. So, yeah, that'd be another layer of, of money for the club. Yeah, it'd be kind of, it'd be strange to kind of see Man United move up to, to that next level, but I think it's absolutely needed. So, mm -hmm. good chat there on the stadium. Really do appreciate that. Yeah. Next, I wanted to move on to a little bit like, I was, someone just said in the chat as well, which I found really funny, they said, City won't want to let us use it either because we'd embarrass them because we'd actually be able to fill it. <laughs> shots fired. <laughs> I know, shots fired. <laughs> but um, on Dan Ashworth, Sir James spoke quite mm -hmm. candidly about Dan Ashworth in his interview, yeah. a breath of fresh air as well. Yeah, yeah. Talk, made a little joke about him being on gardening league. Yeah. I mean, gardening leave. I mean, the rumours around Newcastle is that they want Man United to pay between 10 and 20 million to, to get yeah. him out of that gardening leave. We had news in last night that apparently the relationship was already breaking down with Dan Ashworth and Eddie yeah. Howe towards the end of, you know, before he went on garden leave mm. anyway and wasn't comfortable with the amount of control he had, mm. etc. I mean, Sir Jim, speaking the way he did yesterday, it looks to me as if a compromise will be made and he will be in Man United before the end of end of the season. But what do you think and what have you heard on this? Yeah, I think it's, I think you're right. It's just classic kind of posturing, isn't it? This is the start of a negotiation. You know, Newcastle always, if you're, you're, you're losing someone, you really want to, You'll, you'll put your price, same with the transfers, you, you put another 20 million on top of, mm. or another certain, you know, 10% on top of what you actually want for the player or for the for the person that you're trying to, trying to uh, buy. So I think there will be like a, there will be a compromise. And I think Sir Jim was right when he said, you know, 20 million is silly. And it's, it's a ridiculous amount of money, that isn't it, for essentially what is a, an administrator, albeit a very, very good one. Um, so, I'd, yeah, and he also made the point that they had quite a, a grown up and, and amicable, um, grown up, uh, civilised kind of chat with City over Omar Brada. And, you know, that went, mm. they ended it amicably and, you know, they came to an agreement. Uh, I don't know what the terms of his contract were, maybe they were different, but I think it will, they will come to an agreement in the end. I mean, just at the moment, it's a lose lose, isn't it? Newcastle are losing out because they've lost their sporting director, They're, he's on full pay. You know, tending to his garden, and Man United haven't got the guy who they want um, in like ASAP. So I think both sides have got reason to come back to the table and really, you know, thrash the deal out. I I agree, and I think him mentioning the way City were doing business was another negotiating kind of tactic, putting it out there publicly yeah. and kind of throwing Newcastle under the bus a little bit. But yeah. I, to me, Sir Jim, in that interview, the stuff he was saying it came across like, we are no longer going to be a club that's been taken for a ride, which has happened a lot over the past decade. Yeah, yeah. He's just an ambitious guy, isn't he? And, you know, he's a successful businessman and that's, you know, he's, he's used to getting his, his way. There was talk about potentially Murto still being the sporting director going into the summer. Do you, do you see that? I think that they've, I don't think they've made a decision on it, on John Murto yet. I think they, there would be a case for him staying on in some capacity. It all depends on how how the new system is going to work. Whether whether Dan Ashworth and you know J if Jason Wilcox comes in, you know how are they going to work together? Is Wilcox going to be more sort of leaning towards the academy where you know he had great success at Man City, or is he going to be working uh, more closely with, with Dan Ashworth and and, and Omar Brada? So I, I don't know where where John Murta fits into that. I think I'm sure that'll be a, a discussion that they'll have. Um, 
you know, in the, in the coming weeks. But he's, you know, he's still around now. Um, um, John Murphy, we've seen him at, at matches, and he's still sort of orchestrating that that transfer. You know, or certainly involved in those kind of discussions. Must be strange for him because obviously he'll know the news that Ben Ash was coming. Yeah, to I know. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. Which, I mean, has there been any kind of rumours around how much control Dan Ash was going to have? Like, is he going to build a recruitment team? Jason Wilcott's name obviously has been mentioned. Uh, yeah, I think he, he wouldn't come, would he, if, if he didn't have, like, the a, a, a lot of control. Um, he'll ultimately, he'll answer to, he'll report to, um, to Omar Brad, I imagine, and then up to the, um, up to Jim. Um, and so I... I think he, you know, he he will have a lot of say in it, and they've and they're happy with that as well. That Ineos are happy with that because they know his expertise, they know his his um, you know his experience in the game. They they trust him, so you know why not put put your trust in in that guy to you know to orchestrate the the transfer business. And so when you look at what happened last summer, the opposite was the case, wasn't it? And the summer previously, where Ten Hag. I mean, you always want to give your manager what he wants, but he went a bit too far, didn't he? Mm. You know, they, they kind of spent 100 million euros on Anthony when, and he can't get in the team now, can he? I mean, if, if you if you look at the transfer, and this is another thing that Sir Jim brought up yesterday, he said recruitment is key, isn't it, in, in modern football? And if you look at what they've done so far under Ten Hag, he's bought a right winger um, for 85 million um, pounds and a strike for 72 million pounds. And this summer, you would imagine that they want to buy a right wing. Right yeah, winger. <laughs> so that shows you how much of a mess it is at the moment, isn't it? So even though Hoyland has done very well, yeah, we still we don't have another one. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and when uh, from what I heard last last year, Ten Hag really wanted Hoyland as the the apprentice rather than the master. So he thought, you know, we get a that that he get a you know a, you know a top level experienced striker. He wanted Kane, didn't Kane, he? Yeah, exactly. Kane, and then get Hoyland as his, his um, understudy. And that would have been brilliant, wouldn't it? Oh, God, imagine that. Kind of, <laughs> so that's, you know, that's the kind of... I think that's the level of expectation that Ten Hag had. And then, obviously, it didn't happen, did it? Well, he's at Man United, you would expect. Yeah. But, obviously, prices and the way that financial fair play is working for us and the mistakes we've made in the past, Yeah. it's been hurting us. I do want to kind of move on to a little bit of recruitment, but I do want to ask you... In terms of J Jason Wilcox, I don't know if you've heard much about him, but do you reckon, obviously, because he's worked at City previously, do you reckon that's an Omar Barada recommendation, potentially? I think that they definitely had a good working relationship at Man City. I interviewed Jason Wilcox about eight years ago, seven years ago. He's a really impressive guy. He's really... That was when he was head of the academy at Man City. And you look at all the success that they've had there, not just in terms of bringing... You know, you know, like to call Palmer, Phil Ford, and Rico Lewis through. It's, it's also in the, the trophies that they've won. They're, they're always there. Well, until I know United won it a couple of years ago, but they're always doing well in the FA Youth Cup, um, and they'd always they always make a lot of money out of the academy. And that is they that, sell really well, don't yeah, they? Yeah, that's that's the that's the dual purpose of the academy. It's to you know to bring players who are through to the first team, but then it's also to to make money off the, those that don't. And you know, it might be. A couple of million here, a couple of million there, but it all adds up. And I remember just looking at the fees that they got last year for James Trafford going to Burnley Crazy, for, isn't it? for 19 million, and then um, sorry, uh, Dean Henderson goes to Crystal Palace for for 20 million, and he's an England international. Mm -hmm. And James Trafford's only played in in League One. Oh, a very talented player and younger than Dean Henderson, and had a great Euro under 21s with England. So, but they, that was part of the what Jason Wilcox helped build at Man City that that kind of that level of that dual purpose really where they could make a lot of money off players and, and bring others into the first team. Yeah, I even remember the keeper they sold to Southampton who's now gone down. Bizzuno. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bizzuno, that's the guy. Yeah, yeah. And they got good money for him. I think they got around million, twelve yeah, million yeah. for him and it's yeah. you know, we sold Alanga for fifteen. It's, yeah. it's mad really when you think about it. So we need to be better on the selling side. Mm -hmm. Obviously we want to the whole core of Man United is to bring players through the academy, and we've yeah. we've done excellently at that. And at the moment, you know, Kevin Mayne, Ganacho yeah. as well, like it, it's doing well. There's other players coming through, but selling some for for profit is also it should be in our plans because we've got to be able to be smart, especially with FFP coming yeah. it, it coming into play massively and and, and making mm -hmm. things a bit of a struggle for us. But on the topic of obviously new spotting director, new team of people, 
And Sir Jim was actually speaking about how they will decide the style of football and the yeah. manager will follow that. Do you think Ten Hag and the new era will be on the same page? I think so, yeah. I think when he talks about... Uh, yeah, I'd see a point where he said, you know, we've got to decide what the, yeah. the the style is. But, you know, he's in the same breath he was talking about Cantona and, mm -hmm. and how much he... and Bobby Charlton. And so that, you know, that gives you an indication of, of the kind of player that he likes. He likes a bit of flair. He likes attacking football. And ultimately, Ten Hag is, you know, he believes in that as well. It's just, <clears throat> obviously, this year, it's not really... We've not seen that in evidence much, you know, in, uh, you know the mitigating circumstances with injuries, etc. Started to score more goals this year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're exciting to watch, aren't they, going forward, United now? I mean, it might not be... Scary going the, back yeah, Well, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah half, <laughs> uh, uh, over the halfway line, look all right. But it, it might not work out. There might be you know, like several kind of missed chances like there were against um, Luton on Sunday. But at least there's that, there seems to be that link up between that front three now, doesn't there, where they kind of, they interchange passes quite well and they all seem to know their movements. And I think Ten Hag was right when he said that that comes from having the solidity of knowing who's behind you. You know, because for X months, Casemiro wasn't there and yeah. Luke Shaw wasn't behind Rashford. I know he's obviously out now, which is a big a huge blow for United because he's got a really good relationship with Rashford. So we have started seeing a little more of that attacking football and that's what I'm sure that's what Sir Jim Ratcliffe wants to see as well. Yeah, I mean, and he spoke about, which I think a lot of fans were happy with, about knowing that a lot of managers have failed here and you need to look behind the manager. Mm. And to me, that seems like subtly backing Eric Ten Hag for now. Yeah. And do you, do you think the way things go at the moment, do you think Ten Hag will still be the manager in, in the summer? Well, certainly he'll say till the end of the, the season. I think they'll probably reassess Move contract them. as well, potentially. Well, this is this is it. It's either this summer, it's, it's going to be a sticky, it's going to be a difficult situation because they've got to stick or twist, haven't they? They've, for me, you can't have a manager going into the final year of his contract mm -hmm. because that's sort of saying, oh, we, we don't really believe no. in you. you know, we, yeah. we trust you, but do we trust you that much? Because see, if they really trust him, then they've got to give him a a long-term contract, haven't they? But if they don't, then, you know, they've, they've probably got to get rid of him, haven't they? But then, you know, they've got to look at who, you know, who fits the bill. Has there been any sort of noise around a new contract or anything yet? I mean, I've not, personally, I've not heard or uh, written anything about that. I think they've, the way it was phrased to me when all the negotiations were going on, um, certainly towards the start of this season, was that there's a lot bigger problems than Ted Hag at Man United that need solving. So that, I think they're working through, you know, the... Top to bottom. The, yeah, they're working through, you know, the, the problems in recruiting, etc., and the stadium. And then I think then Ten Hag's a bit further down the list. And that'll be evaluated at the time. And if he can yeah. turn things around this season and kick on, then hopefully he has a future. Because I think, obviously, there's, there's loads of different opinions, but from where I'm stood, I'm like, I would love to actually back and support a manager yeah. through longer than a three-year period. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, I'm, <laughs> how many times have we been here before on the... You know, the this just like the churn of managers yeah. every three years, isn't it? And once you get into that cycle, it's it's just so debilitating for a manager, isn't it, to kind of experience that. Just think, all oh, right, you know, if, if you get actual backing, then for more than two or three years, then you know, it ultimately, re, you know, research is sure that it that it pays off. Um, but they need to get to Champions League, don't they? That's the that's the money spinner, isn't it? As well. Absolutely. I mean, speaking about Champions <coughs> League, apparently. I mean, very many contradicting reports, but from the reports that I trust and I, I read on, on a weekly basis, apparently Man United are going to be on a tight summer budget, mm. mainly due to financial fair play and Champions League is absolutely huge to yeah. bring in that revenue. I mean, is that what you're hearing as well, that Man United are going to have to work very cleverly in the summer transfer window? Yeah, definitely. And I think a lot of it depends on, on sales as well. Mm. You know, like you said earlier, United have got, got to become better at selling players. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, give Phil Jones a new contract. You know, oh. you, you know, it's just they got to, to be fair. They have become a bit more decisive. You know, when they got rid of like Pogba, when they got rid of Lingard and Cavani, rather than offering them new deals, they just cut them loose. But to, the rot had already kind of set in on that kind of. You, you still had long-term contracts for people like Bailly, and you know, it just it was it was never really going to be part of the first team. So. I think, yeah, this, they'll have to sell the kind of Deadwood around the squad um, uh, try and get a good price for them. But th that's easier said than done because they're on, on massive wages, aren't they? Which is another another legacy of the, the previous regime where you just give, 
you know, you give, give ridiculous wages to to players who are pretty mediocre, really. Um, so I, yeah, that's they've, they've got to sell. I think they've got to sell well to have a to say you know to have a good um, good pot of money for for the summer. Do you think in terms of selling, Man United, I think sometimes have maybe been a bit too sentimental in holding on to, to the players. Absolutely, yeah. Do you yeah. think this summer there'll be a different approach? Because, I mean, there's reports coming out that, you know, basically the phrase, nobody's safe, obviously, apart from the main news, the Ganacho, yeah. the Highlands. Do you think that'll be the case going into summer? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'll say to a certain extent, um, Ten Hag showed a, uh, his ruthless side by uh, dropping Maguire, by getting stripping of the captain city, didn't he? I think that... You know, I think he thought that that was Maguire done with. You know, so so they could you know get thirty million, forty million. With <laughs> he thought that I'd show him out the door. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, I, I, that's what I thought at the time. It's just kind of, but it just didn't happen, did it? So, yeah, I think they've, yeah, I think, I mean, but is is Amram Mbappé like you know would he be a, a a championship winning fullback? No. You know, he's not. He's, he, the way that he was talking yesterday, Ratcliffe he said, "I want Man United to win the league and the Champions League." So you know, that who in that squad would you know would be could you see like turning up in a Champions League final and you know taking taking the game by the scruff of the neck? It's very very you know, very you're well, going down to few numbers. Yeah, it's probably less than one, isn't it? Um, it's kind of you know maybe you know Bruno's got it in him. It's, hasn't mad, it's mad that I think Maney. Like, yeah, no, that's a, yeah. That, I just like, thought that as well. Yeah, and yeah. He's like 18 and just yeah, yeah, this season. Yeah, and I most. Think, I think, you know, Maynard's a great example of how far behind the senior squad is at United because yeah. if an 18-year-old can come through the academy in his yeah. first season and outshine yeah. the rest of your team, the majority of them, obviously, credit to Maynard, he's excellent, yeah. but that shows how far off it the rest yeah. of the team are. Well, I remember on, on tour last year, um, he started the first two or three games he, before he got injured against Real Madrid. I remember thinking, God, he looks good, him. You know, it's really kind of... Against like Arsenal as well, and and I know he got injured against Real Madrid, but against Real Madrid, against like their midfield, you look great, didn't you? Just think like you know that is he is he's so composed and so much more, you know, dom he dominates the midfield of for a, for a teenager to do that it says a lot about his his confidence etc. And he's you know it, you know obviously injuries happen, but if if that Real Madrid injury. That injury against Real Madrid hadn't happened. Maybe they would have had a, a more secure start to the season. Well, in terms of you know players that need to, to leave Man United or could be leaving in the summer, I've actually just seen Rob Dawson put out an article. We know Rob, don't we, from, yeah. from the ESPN? Yeah, don't trust him. Yeah. <laughs> no one's joking. Talking about you know having a clear out and yeah. you know players include Christian Eriksen, Rafael Varane, yeah. Casemiro, Maguire, Tomine, Wamasaka, Lindelof and then obviously the the obvious ones like Jaden Sancho, Van yeah. der Beek, Plistri and uh, Martial will be obviously be going, yeah. Brandon Williams, there's so many players there mm. a lot of them will just go and freeze and, yeah. and you won't be able to get a fee for them but in terms of the names of, of, of some that you could get a fee for I mean Casemiro that what is one that keeps coming up, mm. Saudi Arabia interest yeah. and if Man United are going for a midfielder in the summer, they're really going to keep him on three hundred and odd grand a week. Yeah. Do you think? Do you think it could be the end for Varane and Casemiro this summer? I think if they got good offers for him in January, they would have gone then. Really? But it's not. But they, that was never. It's never going to happen because they, they they thought that Saudi Arabia would be the market for them. I think Casemiro, in particular. But the Saudi Ra Saudi rules until the coming summer prohibit them from having. I think it's more than eight. In, uh, foreigners in their squad mm -hmm. um, and they're all all the the four um, public investment fund clubs you know the the mega rich ones had all hit their ceiling like so they'd all got eight but now they're expanding that to the 10 I think maybe even more in the summit so you'll see all four teams going for two big hitters mm -hmm. and I think Casemiro would be one of them so I mean, it's it's a blessing for United that that, that market exists. Because if that market didn't exist, you know, who would take it? Was well, he got three years left on his contract? Yeah, paid seventy mil. Yeah, so and he's on what three fifty or whatever a week. So who would really take? Who would really pay that? No, no one, one would, would they? Not at his age. Obviously, he's been yeah. an excellent player over his career. Yeah, but yeah. At the point he is <clears> now, nobody would be going yeah. in that direction. Well, like that, the game against Luton. I. I Again, like you said, he's he's been a great player, and last season he was one of the best players um, for United. But that Luton game on on Sunday he just looked so far off the pace, and he could have got 
you know, sent off quite easily, couldn't he? Mm -hmm. um, so you think, right, if you're struggling against Luton, you, you, you can't really rely on him for the next, certainly not the next three years. So they've they've got to they've got to be ruthless. They've got to get rid of him. I think Varane, as well. I think he'd be he'd be a, a contender to go because he's, he's on he's on big wages out of contract as well, isn't he? And there's rumours that Man United want to go for centre back in the summer. Yeah, well, I, from Ninja. that book came. Yeah, I remember watching him against United at the start of the season, thinking like, he, "You are a proper defender." That's who United uh, should have signed. United should have signed him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He's, I think it, it all came down to the fact we didn't shift Maguire. Yeah. So we didn't have the money mm. to spend on Kim and Jay, and then we signed Johnny Evans on a free. And Johnny yeah. Evans has done a great job. Has, do you yeah. not get me One wrong? One of the best players of the season. Yeah, that's what I mean. But again. Mm. United shouldn't be at the point where that's happening. No. Credit to Johnny, he's done great, but yeah, yeah. He shouldn't, we shouldn't be in a position where he's no. coming in and, and having to be one of the best players. And I don't think he... I heard that at the start of, certainly when he when he was a free agent, that he, if he'd not, if United hadn't come in for him, he could have easily retired. Mm -hmm. You know, if the, the, there wasn't, like, a, lo a load of offers for him. You know, and that's, that's not being ru rude to him or cruel. Yeah. It's just kind of, you know, he's 35, he'd had um, in, a lot of injuries, but... And certainly when he went on the United tour, he went with the, the under-21s, didn't he? Yeah. He, he played in that game against uh, Wrexham, didn't he, in, in San Diego? Ten so Hag liked him and then he kind of... Did yeah. So great credit to him for impressing, you know, Ten Hag and, and, um, and the youth coaches there and actually getting, you know, first-team players. But I think if you asked him at the start of the season, would you, do you think you'll end up playing, playing 30 matches in the first team? He says he, he would have said no. He, he probably said half maximum. Yeah. But now he's, you know, he's relied on... You know, they they rely on him a lot. When he, to be fair to him, when he plays, he plays really oh, well. He's played really well. He's, he's played really well. But mm -hmm. in terms of other players, obviously Scott McTominay's won twelve points for United off the bat, like just in yeah. general now this season. And but he was another one that could have left in the yeah. summer. And I think Ten Hag was okay with it. Yeah. Obviously, when you look at a player like McTominay, who's come up through the academy, it's pure profit and yeah. financial fair play. Mm -hmm. Do you think he's a contender to go in the summer? I think you're right. That that is a big factor. The the pure profit because he's come through the academy. Um, and I think I'd, I'd, they certainly they were willing to let him go last summer. Um, Bayern Munich were definitely looking at him. So and if they wanted a number six and still want a number six now, so I, I don't know whether they come back in for him. But I, I think, like you said earlier, I think pretty much any offer will be considered at the moment. I don't see McTominay as a six, but maybe in the Bundesliga yeah. he could. Yeah, mm. I it's, think he'd flourish. Like he'd flourish there. I think he'd, I'd love to see him go and. Be the main man there, or not the main man, obviously, because we've got some amazing players. But actually, be part of a, a regular team because he's. He, do you think he'd start regularly for Bayern Munich? Um, uh, he might do. I don't know. It depends who the manager is, doesn't yeah. it? I guess. But yeah, he's he's not going to be starting here, is he? So that's that's the thing. I think Ted Hag's yeah. kind of s sealed his place as being a off the bench. Yeah, and he's brilliant now. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just whether yeah. he's he wants to do that. Yeah. Obviously, going into next season, and whether yeah. United can, you know, maybe. Can they afford to lose out on potentially like 35, 40 million? Yeah. If I was him, I'd leave because, you know, there's, he's, he's um, lit it up with Scotland this year, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. He's dragged them to the to the Euros. So he's probably in the form of his career, but he's not getting a game here. So, you know, try, try, your, try your arm elsewhere. In terms of obviously the right wing situation for Manchester United, Sancho, do we think he'll be moving on for Sushar in the summer? I, again, I think that's up for debate, isn't it? He's, he's, they'll probably they'll assess that and then see what what happens. But you know, from what we've seen so far, he's he's not really pulled up any trees, has he? So I just I think don't. with Ten Hag there, it just it's yeah, if that's it. So if, if Ten Hag's there next season, I, there's no way for him, no way that he'll he'll play. And then in terms of obviously, there's been a lot of reports about. I'm sure you've seen Michael Elise. Yeah. And. I saw one the other day that said he's, he's the only player so far that Ineos have approved and also the United Recruitment Department have approved. Right. Obviously, things can change when Dan Ash was coming in, but I think a lot of fans are thinking, you know, we're clearly looking at a right winger. Yeah. Michael Elise is clearly, he is being scouted mm -hmm. by United. That's obvious. But what where does that leave the rest of our players? Because you've got, <coughs> you know, you've yeah. got Ahmad, you've got Palistri. You assume Palistri will go, but what's going to happen with Ahmad? Mm -hmm. You've got Sancho. You've got Anthony. Anthony yeah. You know, Ganacho is doing well there. Is yeah. he going to be competing with Rashford then? Yeah. I mean, do you know anything around that area of United? I've not. I've not heard anything about him personally, but I'd, you know, I'd, I don't see why he wouldn't be one of the players that they look at because he's left footed as well as he can do the inverted winger thing. So, I mean, I'd, I'd have him over every one of the play, those players you just mentioned, with the possible exception of, of Garnacho because I quite like Garnacho. Um, 
but I think he prefers playing on the left, doesn't he? So he's, he's certainly better than Anthony, isn't he? I mean, that's another. If, where does that leave Anthony? Does he get sold? He, like, yeah, you can't, can't, yeah. Who to again? Like and you say, can you? Know. And, and who's going to buy him? And Ten Hag, does he regret that signing? Like it's, it's yeah, a it's strange one. I remember when when Ten Hag first took over. Um, I remember speaking to a Dutch journalist who was very well in the, much in the know in in Holland, and he's covering Ajax, and he said that. Ten Hag loves Anthony, really loves him, but you won't get him for. You say no, but Ajax won't sell him for unless it's a a mega fee. In, and they was, and I was like, what is a mega fee? And they were saying, oh well, you know, maybe like 70, 80 million euros. And then all of a sudden, you know, they end up paying hundred for him. Yeah. So it's like you know, so they they properly messed up with that one. And really overpaid him, and they love overpaid in the in the wages as well. So. They, They've probably got to try and sell him, haven't they? I wonder. I wonder what what was the attraction there. Maybe he came to the Premier League and realised maybe it wasn't just wasn't cut out for it, or yeah. or what. He's still young, but it's you think if you're going for another right winger in the summer under Ten Hag, you're looking that is that the end of the road? Like it has to be, surely. He's he's one of the most one-footed players I've I've seen, mm -hmm. and that's not. I mean, God, how hard is it for a player? You know, surely the prerequisite for a professional elite football should be able to, you, know, you can play with both feet. Um, so, yeah, I've, there have been games where he's looked all right, but, you, you know, you wouldn't, like I said earlier, you wouldn't have him in your team in a Champions League fight, would you? Exactly. And then in terms of Harry Maguire, done quite well this season for United. Um, yeah. Definitely, you know, turned his United career around for this mm -hmm. season. Yeah. And I think drove his value up. Is yeah. he someone, obviously, I think he's 30, 31 now, moving into the last mm -hmm. year of his Going to have a year left on his contract, yeah. I think, in the summer. Do you reckon he'll be moving it on? I think it depends on who comes in for him and whether he thinks that's a, a good offer. Um, I remember like speaking to, um, well, speaking to people at United and other agents have mentioned this in the past that if it's really hard. Another reason why it's so hard to get someone out of Man United is because like that's the that's the pinnacle. Yeah, you know so. If you're Harry Maguire, you, like you were captain until a year ago, and then you know the phone rings and it's um, you know I don't know say say Southampton come up to the Prem and say oh you, we want you to come and be our centre half and be our captain. It's like that is a it's a big step down, that isn't it? So why would you and it'll, it'll be on a big wage at United as well. So can they afford to pay that? I just think it would probably be a situation, unless it's a really good offer, he'll probably see out the, the last year of his contract and, you know, that's he's got every right to, hasn't he? He's, you know, they, they treated him pretty poorly last season, um, tried to get him out of the club and then he, you know, he took it on the chin and whenever he's played this season, he, he's looked really good. It's whether he would want regular game time and also sometimes, you know, the club might have to put the foot down a little bit in terms of what are we looking for for the future. Yeah, yeah. But I suppose you can't force. No, he's, he, yeah. He, so yeah, you can't force him out, and then you know the, the wages are huge, aren't they? Unless he gets a, like I say, if, if someone you know a, a club from Italy or Spain came in for, for him, they'd have to pay. They couldn't afford like half his wages, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of money to write off, isn't it, over a player yeah. who's and I played understand quite the player not wanting to yeah, downgrade yeah. his pay. Like that's understandable. Yeah, you yeah. Signed well, a contract you gave me this contract in the first place. Yeah. You, you've got to honour it. So I mean, looking towards maybe possible targets in the summer, it's going to be interesting. Sir Jim's first summer in charge and just in terms of like the positions really because you know you look at Man United and people will say they need a right back because mm. I, I think Wan Masak will end up going do they need a left back because of Luke Shaw's injury concerns yeah. and obviously what's happening with Malassia mm. you look at um, they could do with the midfielder potentially I mean you look at the forward line right winger obviously you know the striker for Hoyland centre backs yeah. do you think the priority for Man United is going to be the um the striker for Holland and like a centre back potentially, obviously with Masando as well, his <coughs> injuries and stuff. Yeah, I think I think you do need a you do need a striker, don't you? An experienced striker. I don't think you necessarily have to break the bank for 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 you know an experienced striker to help take the workload off Hoyland. Um because like he has come good, like you were saying earlier, but it's it's taken him such a long time um, to to settle in because he's so young, he's not used to you know playing at this level. Uh, every three days, so so yeah, I'd say striker. I'd say depends on like you were saying earlier. If if McTominay leaves, if Ericsson goes, then that's that's a two big holes in uh, Casemiro as well. So you've got to have another, at least one central midfielder to play 
alongside Mano, haven't you? So, yeah, you're looking at the spine of a team, aren't you, really? And it feels like Man United go for that every year. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's, I, I think I'm, I'm on the same wavelength view there. Obviously, right back and right winger would be really nice, but I think mm. we have to, you can't have just Hoyland as a striker. And you, yeah. I'd, I'd, midfield, I think, needs investment. And like you said, centre back wise, we, uh, it's an ageing department for United yeah. and we need longevity there. But in terms of like injuries at the moment, obviously, we've got Malassia mm. been out for a whole season. Yep. Knee ligament is the yeah, yeah. is the injury yeah. and we don't know when he's going to be back. Mm -hmm. Mason Mount's another one, you know, number seven shirt yeah. at the start of the season, just not really been able to get in the team, but feels like he's coming back soonish. Yeah. And then you look at Luke Shaw now and Ram Masaka injured as well. Mm -hmm. Dallow's the only fit fullback. I mean, what do you think the thinking was with sending Regulon back? Yeah, I was surprised by that because I didn't think he'd done that badly. Um so yeah, and I suppose it was just cutting costs, really, wasn't it? Do you think that's what it was? Literally, just pure cost. I think he, they thought certainly the the rationale I was given was that it's because they've got to play so few games in the second half of the season. Mm -hmm. You know that, that what's the point in having three left backs on your book, books? I know that obviously Malassi has been injured for a long time. I think they probably thought that Malassi would be back sooner, but he's he struggled to get back to full fitness. So. Yeah, I think that was that was part of the the reason, you know, to stay within the FFP limit and to free a bit of money up for the summer, I think, as well. So, yeah, I, I was surprised, but then Tenag definitely wanted to streamline his squad because, you know, what's it's obviously the other side of the coin is you have a squad of, you know, 26, 27, 28 players who are playing for 18 slots every weekend you know they're not going to be playing midweek are they now so it's kind of I understand the streamlining your squad but Luke Shaw is injury prone yeah obviously you know and then Malassia we don't know when he's going yeah. to be back like are you comfortable playing Lindelof there for the remainder of the season <laughs> I don't, and if I don't that think Lindelof's you, comfortable playing there if that costs you an FA Cup like, yeah he could do yeah he can do like and these are the things you've got to think yeah. about yeah I think that Martinez would play there that I'm about as well isn't there I know but, I, get, but I feel like they took a risk and it's backfired yeah. potentially but yeah I don't so it did surprise me because I'm not, I can't imagine that that deal would have cost Man United a lot or saved them a lot of money, the Reguillon, Reguillon deal. That's how tight it is, maybe. Because, yeah, maybe, yeah, because they, they signed him literally at the drop of a hat, didn't they? Right, you know, we've got got an injury, we need a left back, it was him or... Um, career. Yeah, and then they just went for him, so it's, um, yeah, it was a bit of a surprising one, that. And then lastly, in terms of Mason Mount, do you have have you have have you had any word or any inkling on what the plan plan is for Mason Mount or where he even fits in Ten Hag's plans? Um, I think they moved him around so much, didn't they, at the start of the season? I think ultimately, I'd, I wouldn't be surprised if you end up seeing him on the right wing because that's where he had his best spell at Chelsea, wasn't it? He? he was Player of the Year on there. The left and the right. Yeah. yeah. So certainly not. I'd, I don't see him. You know, when we were talking about midfielders earlier, I completely forgot about him because he's, he's barely played, has he, this season? But he, he certainly didn't look that comfortable in that deep role alongside... Bruno uh, and Casemiro. Yeah, Casemiro. Essentially, for me, uh, Mount and Bruno are very similar players, aren't they? And I think the only time that I've seen Mount and thought, yeah, you you fit in here, was when there was that pre-season friendly in... Was it in Norway? Where yeah, Bru I was there. Where Bruno didn't play, did he? And he was in the and 10. Mount played as number 10, and, and he was, like, brilliant. And it crystal... Palace in the cup as well. Yeah. I remember him playing yes, against yeah, him. He yeah, did yeah. really well. But do you think there's a do you think there's a situation where he could challenge Bruno for that spot? Or do you think obviously Bruno's yeah. ten house captain? Yeah. Like... Probably not. But I think if I it depends if you can like alter the the system and plays you know like four one four one. He, but that's that's putting a lot of pressure on Mayno, isn't it? To to protect that back four and keep the keep the player moving. And plus as well, I look at it and I think why. I like Mount and I think he's a good player mm. and I was happy with the transfer last season, but why was he a priority then if we can't fit him in? Yeah, I, I did think it was strange. I did, I did think they were desperate for him. I, I, you know, desperate. For re, there was a desperate need for reinforcements in that area. Same when they signed Van der Beek. I was like, oh, where, does he, where does he fit in here? Um, so, yeah, I thought other areas of the team need, need a strengthening ahead of that attacking midfield role. So, yeah, I, maybe they thought he just... That he could sort of sculpt him into a deep line midfielder, um, and certainly ten, from the way that Ten Hag was talking, he thought that Mount was up for that. You know, he wanted. I think he said he wanted to become an all-round, a complete midfielder. So maybe that's still the plan long term.
yeah it'll be interesting to see but look paul thank you so much for coming on the show no problem. really interesting especially about you know talking about old trafford and hopefully we'll see the appointment of dan ashworth very very soon and yeah thank you so much for, for coming on the show yeah. and hopefully we can do more stuff together well thanks for having me thank you and thank you everyone as well for getting your comments in really do appreciate all the comments in the chat just quickly i want to read out some super chats coming in quickly so nick cantor said beth's right i don't know what you were talking about there but thank <laughs> you um, joss waring says is there any way to list old trafford and use it as a museum and then use it for the youth and women's team i think it'd be a bit of a yeah. it would be too much be of a too money big, wouldn't it? yeah yeah um, ben niblet says 100k minimum design it like old trafford just bigger and better um i think it'll cost more than 100 yeah, 100K. it's probably like capacity in here, but yeah, that's... Um, oh, 100,000 yeah, yeah. fans, that's what you mean. Yeah. Okay, I get it, 100,000 minimum. I mean, mm. I think around the 80, 90,000 mark is what, yeah. they'll be, what they'll be looking to. Lastly, I forgot to ask you this, and this has just reminded me, actually. Do we know well, anything about, like, who are the architects that are going to be taking on this project yet? It's, um, uh, Populous have got the... Uh, they're a group of architects that have got the um, rights for it, haven't they? There's another... Is it, Another company called Legends as well are also involved. Populous did Spurs, didn't they? Yeah, they've done done lots. I think they did. Uh, was it the that big the big stadium in? Sorry, that's not very yeah uh, precise. The one in Perth where United played mm -hmm. uh, in pre-season, which is amazing. Um, uh, so yeah, they've they've got a lot of expertise in that area. So there's every reason to think that they've, they've appointed the right people for that. They've done some really grand stadiums and. Lastly, as well, one is question because I saw this in your article. I forgot to do this. Sir Jim also done a five billion billion sort of investment into something in Belgium, was it? Yeah, it's, it's all like I think it was a, a massive like chemical plant, basically, or something. Uh -huh. it, it basically, I'd, I'd included that to show how they they know how to create grand structures, basically, mm -hmm. and 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 spend that you know that much money on it, and you know so sort of grand designs aren't, aren't beyond them basically you know they how to they know how to create you know, big structures and you know and what the costs that come with it etc well, five billion on a, a chemical plant in Ant it was antwerp i think in belgium yeah. is i mean he's had the he's had the experience in it i know it's different to a, a stadium but at least the experience is there but yeah Thank you, Paul, and thank you, everyone, in the chat as well. Really do appreciate it. And also, let me know in the comments if you like this new set and the new setup because I really like it. I can't lie. I've been looking at it, and I, I do really like it. So hit a like on the video as well. Let me know in the comments what you would want, either a new stadium or redeveloped. I think that when we did the poll, I think it ended just just the new stadium one. So really? I feel like people Surprising, are coming around to that yeah. idea a little bit more. And I think it's the way forward, but I know people have opposite opinions marks very strong on wanting to keep it and that's just people have different opinions but thank you everyone for watching have a lovely rest of your day we'll be back later on with the 8pm show mark will be back and i will see you on the next one